Good morning and welcome to the third in our four-part lecture series. We're delighted to have all of you with us this morning. And today we are moving into one of the really well-known parts of what are now the Vatican Museums of Rome, the Sistine Chapel. We're gonna have some really interesting behind the scenes information that you probably didn't know. And I think that you're really gonna enjoy it. Once again, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome art historian, architectural historian, Renaissance expert, and general man about Florence, Rocky Ruggiero. Rocky, so great to see you again. Thanks so much Thank for being you. with us. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> Thank you so much for your fabulous introductions, folks. Thank you all for taking the time uh, to join me, to join the patrons, to join the Friends of the Uffizi Gallery as well uh, today. And as Katie mentioned, uh, we do have some kind of interesting um, not necessarily new, but relatively unknown information about the Sistine Chapel, uh, because, of course, when people go to the Sistine Chapel, uh, what they usually do is spend the entire time with their necks craned, uh, looking up and, of course, admiring that, that ceiling that you see behind me in my virtual background. But believe it or not, there is quite a bit more uh, to this chapel than just its ceiling. And so just back up a bit and talk about the sort of physical reality of the structure. Again, if you're not familiar with it, that rectangular building with the triangular roof and lightning rod is in fact the Sistine Chapel. All right? uh, you can see that the architect, at least according to Giorgio Vasari, was named Baccio Pontelli and that the structure was built over about an eight year period, 1473 to 1481. If you were with us last weekend, you remember, of course, that the chapel takes its name from its patron, who is the gentleman that you see seated right there, Pope Sixtus IV. So technically, it is the Sistine Chapel because it is Sixtus's chapel, right? Which in Italian translates to the Capella Sistina. And we talked about Sixtus, this sort of self-made man coming from a rather impoverished background. Uh, and through the Franciscan order, he in fact was a Franciscan, and then elected Pope in the year 1471, and is largely held responsible for the invention of a tradition called nepotism. And remember that word nepotism comes from the Italian nipote, and nipote could translate either as grandson or as nephew. And we talked about how Pope Sixtus IV went to great lengths to, in fact, uh, establish his nephews in any number of roles, whether it was the Cardinal Rafael Riario, Cardinal Giuliano della Rovere, who became Pope Julius II, or um, uh, Girolamo uh, Riario as well. All of these men set up by their very powerful and very uh, famous uncle. Uh, now, just to orient you as to where we are, uh, any of you who've been to the Sistine Chapel <clears throat> may remember experiencing a certain sense of being disoriented. In other words, the Vatican museums are so large, you just kind of feel like you're flowing through a river with this sea of humanity around you. And the next thing you know, you're being pushed into the Sistine Chapel. Uh, and then unless you're, of course, you're with the patrons who like to travel in style, uh, your experience is somewhat agitated. The guards start saying, don't stop here, keep moving, no photo, no video, don't breathe, don't look at the ceiling for too long, please just get out of here as quickly as you can. Um, and at that point, you really have no idea where you are in the sort of grand scheme of things. And so I just thought that I'd take a moment to orient the location of the Sistine Chapel, which you see here. And this photograph is actually taken from the top of the dome of the Basilica of St. Peter. And so technically speaking, the Sistine Chapel is immediately adjacent to the Basilica, whose facade you can see right here. And then, of course, the anterior piazza designed by Bernini. The Vatican museums, as we know them, of course, are mainly located in this area, uh, which uh, is the uh, Cortile um, Belvedere, these two sort of descending rectangular courtyards that were designed and built by Bramante for uh, Pope Julius II uh, later on. And in fact, to make this even more explicit to all of you, here is a floor plan of essentially Vatican City as we know it today. 
the basilica here outlined in black at the top of your screen, the anterior piazza, uh, then the Belvedere courtyards. And I'll show you why in just one sec. But this, for instance, is where that giant bronze pine cone is, the Cortile de la Pina, as number three is sometimes referred to as well. Uh, and when you visit the museums, as many of you probably already know, of course, you go up that steep escalator. Uh, if you have a moment, I always recommend going to the Pinacoteca first, the painting gallery of the collection. But then you walk through the courtyard of the pine cone, then through the doorway here, you double back into the octagonal courtyard. If you were looking at those images before we began, you saw that the patrons of the arts in the Vatican museums, in fact, are involved, the, well, actually have restored, have sponsored the restoration of two of Canova's statues that are actually located inside of the courtyard. And then you head further down, and then you begin to walk past an almost endless array of antiquities, all right? Now, you may remember the sheer quantity of ancient statuary inside of the Vatican museums. And as I like to point out to everyone, if that much ancient statuary survives today, the question is just how much did the ancient Romans actually produce? It's just a mind blowing statistic if you stop to contemplate. Then you make your way further down, you pass past the tapestries uh, that are hung inside of these two hallways. And then of course the extraordinary 130 meter long hall of the maps, which were also uh, restored, the maps where that is, by the generosity of the patrons of the arts. And then when you get down to the end, you know, this is that critical moment. I was just discussing this with some of my students, where if you're in a hurry and you're in luck, the guard can pull that cordon back and usher you right down the stairs into the Sistine Chapel, excuse me, directly. If you're not in a hurry, my advice is to turn left at this point so that you can actually see the staggeringly beautiful frescoes by Raphael, which adorn the walls of the former apartments of Pope Julius II. The apartments are rectangular, rectangular right here. And then you're actually forced, you may remember, you go past that outdoor walkway and then into the hall of Constantine, the room of Heliodorus, the Stanza della Signatura, and then finally the room of the Borgo, nel, oh, sorry, the uh, fire in the Borgo, the um, incendio nel Borgo, and then you drop down. And you have to go through the entirety of the um, modern and contemporary art collection. What a shame. Now, just a quick story. I remember when I was an undergraduate and I would go to Rome, uh, I would have to purchase a separate ticket to visit the modern and contemporary art gallery. It was a different museum. Um, those were the good old days where you didn't have to make a reservation or anything like that to get inside. The crowds have become, of course, so large today that everyone who visits the Vatican museums is now forced to essentially go through that collection so that we can spread the people out and slow down their entry into, dun, 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 there it is, number 13, the Sistine Chapel, the Capella Sistina, which just like in the aerial photo I showed you a moment ago, is situated between the Cortili Belvedere and the Basilica of St. Peter. Here's a hypothetical reconstruction of the Constantinian Basilica. This was the original Basilica of St. Peter, consecrated in the year 326 under the reign of a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine. And remember, this church actually stood until the beginning of the 16th century when Pope Julius II decided to knock it down and to begin the construction of the basilica that we see today. So that is why you can clearly see the Sistine Chapel, right? And again, this is hypothetical. This is not an historical uh, image, but you can see the Sistine Chapel situated right there. And you can also see the Villa Belvedere, right? And in fact, those two long descending courtyards uh, that were designed and built by Bramante were intended to connect the villa at the top of the hill to the Apostolic Palace, which is down here instead at the bottom of the hill. So the idea that the Sistine Chapel in many ways is inextricably linked to the history of the uh, Church of St. Peter's, both old and new, because of course that is how we imagine it today. Here is the structure, uh, again, from the top of the dome of the uh, Sistine Chapel, and I want you to, or the top of St. Peter's, excuse me, and you can see the rectangular shape, again, that triangular roof that I mentioned a moment ago. Now, just to give you a sense of scale, because again, many of us have been inside, 
but have perhaps never stopped to contemplate its dimensions. It's actually not rectangular. All right? It's quadrilateral, but not rectangular, because all four corners are not 90 degrees. In fact, it is wider at uh, one end, at the altar end, than it is at the other. But just to give you its dimensions, uh, the Sistine Chapel is 134 feet long. It is 44 feet wide, and it has a maximum height, exterior height, of 68 feet. All right, so it's not small, but it's not terribly large either. And for me, really one of the most fascinating things is to see people's reactions when they finally get to the Sistine Chapel. And some people, of course, say, I thought it'd be bigger. Other people instead say, I thought it would be small. The structure was commissioned and named, as I mentioned, after Pope Sixtus IV, um, who was elected in 1471. And the architect supposedly of this, um, Baccio Pontelli. The consecration, in other words, the moment that it was blessed and then used for celebrating mass or the technical term officiated was August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption of 1483. And in fact, it was consecrated by its namesake patron, Pope Sixtus IV. All right, so this is the way we see the chapel today. This is what the Sistine Chapel actually looked like in the 15th century. Right, which is not terribly different, but there are some important modifications that have taken place over the last six centuries or so. I think the first and most obvious of which is the addition of those buttresses to the outside of the chapel, those sort of, um, you see right here? And they're kind of now part of the identity in that earlier photograph that I showed you, you could see them on the other side as well. They're not present in this particular image. They didn't need it then. Uh, these tall, steep walls, which have been supporting that roof for so long. Notice also the crenulation up here. Right? And that's, in fact, the architect, this Baccio Pontelli, to whom Vasari attributes the chapel, was actually a military architect, um, which is why the structure looks, in fact, so fortified. But you'll know, of course, that today, let me go back just one sec again, that that kind of gangway has been covered. You see that? So you no longer really get the impression of crenulation per se, but of sort of windows. The reason they added this roof was in fact to protect the paintings on the inside. There was stagnant water that was collecting here inside of the gangway. That water was gradually infiltrating the walls um, and causing quite a bit of damage on the interior. So fortunately they were able to cover it uh, up and to protect the chapel. So that, you know, just to give you a sense of course of how the structure has evolved over the last six centuries or so. Now consider that when the structure was built under the patronage of Sixtus and uh, by the pen supposedly of Baccio Pontelli, the intention was to build a chapel whose dimensions would in fact correspond with those of the Temple of Solomon as described in the Old Testament book of wisdom. Because in many ways Sixtus was sort of trying to appropriate, if you will, the legacy and the um, uh, prestige of the uh, ancient king. And so the idea that technically the shape and the look of the Sistine Chapel is supposed to be based directly on that of the Temple of Solomon and its description in the Old Testament. Today, of course, I believe that, you know, the sort of our collective imaginations most often so associate the Sistine Chapel with an event, an event that doesn't happen very often. In fact, in Italian, there is an expression that I use very often, which is ogni morte di papa. And when something happens very infrequently, the Italians say it happens at the death of a pope. And of course, popes don't die every day. And so that's the expression that they actually use. But when popes do die, a new pope is, of course, elected within the walls of the Sistine Chapel in an event known as a conclave or a conclave, as we call it in English. Now, you remember I told you that the chapel was consecrated in 1483, but the first ever conclave to take place inside of the chapel occurred in 1492, a very easy year to remember, and the election was for uh, a very ominous pope by the very uh, questionable pope by the name of Pope Alexander VI. Um, his real name was Rodrigo Borgia. And so the first pope elected in the Sistine Chapel was in fact the notorious Borgia Pope himself. And you can see here the cardinals who have gathered around. 
Of course, everyone knows about the stove inside of the Sistine Chapel, uh, where the, um, the ballots, the, the voting ballots are in fact burned and whose smoke then essentially communicates to the public whether or not uh, there is consensus uh, as regards to the new pope or instead um, discord. Uh, and so the white smoke means we have a pope. The black smoke, of course, means that we do not. And that smoke, which in the old days, there was some sort of secret recipe they followed for watering the straw that kind of changed the color or what have you. Today, of course, we have more modern methods of doing it. But the, um, the, the stove, okay, then you can see the actual tube, the exhaust tube. This is not there. Whenever people walk into the Sistine Chapel, they immediately, it's amazing they'll even overlook Michelangelo's ceiling and look desperately for the chimney. <laughs> Where's the stove? Where's the chimney uh, with which the white or the black smoke uh, is produced? And then they're disappointed to discover that the chimney is both constructed and then uh, taken down uh, as soon as these conclaves begin and then end. You can see it actually it goes up and then out through the window. And every time they prepare for a conclave, they have to call in the Vigili del Fuoco, dun, 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 the firemen who, of course, uh, are the experts in assembling temporary chimneys. Uh, think about this. Every time a pope is elected, the um, firemen have to come in and they um, repel here up on the roof. You can see that same um, lightning rod that I showed you a moment ago actually assembling the structure itself. And so there's an amazing history uh, to this chapel that's still very much alive, obviously. And that, of course, has to do with the event that takes place. Right? Now, here, of course, is what everyone wants to see. The most celebrated ceiling in the world, the most celebrated ceiling in history, which, of course, was executed over the four and a half year period that you see here and by the great artist Michelangelo. All right, so this is what the Sistine Chapel looks like today. But this is more than likely what the Sistine Chapel looked like before Michelangelo came and painted the uh, ceiling of the chapel. And so I use this image. Now, this is a 19th century engraving. This is someone's sort of reconstruction of what we think the chapel looked like by simply removing all of Michelangelo's uh, painting. Uh, and what it does is it reveals the architecture of the ceiling, the lunettes here above the windows, the triangular spandrels uh, above the uh, lunettes, the uh, uh, pendentives, the sort of upside down triangular corners are called pendentives. And then you can also see here that the ceiling is curved. It's not a barrel vault. It's not a perfect semicircular ceiling, but there is curvature to it. It's not flat. And the most typical way to, of course, paint ceilings before a guy named Michelangelo came along was to paint the ceilings of chapels and churches blue in color and then to adorn the blue with golden stars. That, are the, the, that is what those little dots are that you see up there on the ceiling, right? So this is the pre-Michelangelo. That's the post-Michelangelo. I dare say that the post-Michelangelo does represent a rather significant improvement to the overall chapel. But when people, you know, you're ushered in there, by this point, you're semi-exhausted because again, the, the Vatican museums are so extensive, there's so much to see. Um, you look up at the ceiling and then you sort of usher it out, but few people realize that there, believe it or not, is a very strong imprint of a gentleman by the name of Lorenzo il Magnifico de Medici in the Sistine Chapel, right? And so this whole series, of lectures that I've been giving is, is, is in a way to demonstrate the sort of marriage between these two, figurative marriage, of course, between the Della Rovere family, the family of Pope Sixtus IV and of Pope Julius II, as well as many other prestigious characters, and the Medici, because next week, the climax of all this will, in fact, be a discussion of shared genius, right, of how it's actually the collections at the Uffizi Museum, which really do reflect the uh, largesse of the Medici family, and those of the Vatican Museums, which of course uh, reflect the legacy of the popes, two of uh, most important of which were the Della Rovere popes, and have come together. Well, Lorenzo, uh, you may remember, uh, was a great patron of the arts. And in fact, in a gesture of goodwill, in the year 1482, dispatched a couple of his most important artists to Rome to paint the walls of the Sistine Chapel. 
And in fact, the way I like to sum up the sort of group of artists that he sends down, um, well, let me first tell you why. The reason he, of course, sends these artists down uh, was a rather important altercation that he and Sixtus IV had had some four years earlier. You may remember that day that will live in infamy in the city of Florence, which is April 26th of the year 1428, 1478, excuse me, 28, 1478, uh, which of course was the day that the uh, Pazzi family with the blessing of Pope Sixtus IV uh, and the Duke of Urbino, Federico da Montefeltro, uh, attempted and were partly successful in the assassination of the uh, uh, brothers Medici. Lorenzo survived, of course. Uh, his brother Giuliano was not so fortunate and in fact uh, was murdered uh, inside of Florence Cathedral, victim of 19 dagger blows uh, to his particular body, as of course the medal here demonstrates the luctus publicus, right? The uh, public mourning over the premature death of poor uh, Giuliano de Medici. Now you remember the consequences of this uh, uh, assassination, this you know, partially successful, some would call it foiled um, assassination attempt, were dire. And Italy went into crisis, particularly because it was essentially everyone against Florence. And you may remember that I ended my last uh, presentation with Lorenzo's daring diplomatic mission when he went to uh, Naples to uh, convince uh, the king of Naples, Fernando, to back off, to not attack his city, and probably did so by, by uh, giving him quite a bit of wealth and money. And so there was this very sort of tentative peace agreement that was reached between um, Lorenzo il Magnifico and Pope Sixtus IV, who of course uh, was uh, violently angry with the Medici, but with Florence as well, and put the city under interdict, right? And so Lorenzo thought that perhaps he could use some of his celebrated artists as ambassadors. That's kind of the pretense of today's presentation, these artistic ambassadors who were handpicked from Lorenzo's sort of stable of extraordinary artists and sent to Rome to decorate the side walls of the Pope's recently completed chapel known as the Sistine Chapel. In other words, everyone knew that Sixtus was building this, Lorenzo presuming he'd have to decorate it. So why not lend the Pope, free of charge, of course, a couple of his important artists. Now in 1482, who might these artists be? Well, theoretically, one of those superstar artists could have been Leonardo da Vinci because he was in Florence. He was now uh, 30 years old and in fact had contact with the Medici family. But unfortunately, Leonardo was not available because that same year he had sent a resume to the Duke of Milan looking for a place of employment as court artist. I just recorded the podcast about this. I love the, the Leonardo da Vinci's job search. Uh, how someone like Leonardo da Vinci qualifies himself for a place of employment. So Leonardo was gone. He went to Milan. He got the job, rest assured. You might think, oh, well, what about Filippino Lippi, the son of the sex-craved Carmelite priest painter, Fra Lippo Lippi? But the problem with Filippino, who is an extraordinary artist, he was only 23, uh, not yet mature enough to actually go to Rome to paint the walls of the Sistine Chapel. And in fact, the painting of the Sistine Chapel was already underway. Now, it's often misconstrued that all of the artists who painted these sidewall chapels that you see uh, were, in fact, sent down by Lorenzo il Magnifico, when in reality, painting was already taking place. And the artist who'd been assigned the contract to adorn the walls of the Sistine Chapel was named um, Pietro Vannucci, better known to the world as Il Perugino. Right, and Il Perugino, who was a student of the same teacher who taught Leonardo, whose name was Andrea del Verrocchio, had already begun uh, decorating the walls of the Sistine Chapel. And in particular, uh, a, an altarpiece that was situated here, a high altarpiece for the chapel, which was destroyed. The altarpiece was when, in fact, Michelangelo came along in 1536 and, of course, painted the altar wall of the chapel with his last judgment painting. So, and in fact, not only did um, Michelangelo's painting destroy Perugino's, that was situated right there, uh, Michelangelo actually destroyed two of his own lunettes, which he executed 
when in fact he was painting the ceiling uh, years earlier as well. And you can see them right there. Now, the uh, painting is gone. Um, Perugino's altarpiece, which we know depicted the Assumption of the Virgin Mary. But fortunately, one of his students, whose name was Pintoricchio, uh, painted a work of the same subject that many of us believe probably look, uh, looks very similar to what his master had done inside of the Sistine Chapel and this beautiful painting, which is located inside of the Capo di Monte Museum down in Naples, Italy. Uh, and you can see the um, association. If you're familiar with Perugino, then you'll know that Pinturicchio, in fact, looks quite a bit uh, like his master, like um, Perugino style. Here's the upper portion of the Assumption. Here is this incredibly beautiful lower portion with a self-portrait. This is Pinturicchio right back there looking out at us uh, in the image uh, as well. So that the uh, earliest uh, part of the decoration of the Sistine Chapel was now lost because of Michelangelo's Last Judgment, painted presumably some 50 years later. But what survives okay, of this painting campaign that went on in the uh, early 1480s, beginning in 1482, is in fact the series of rectangular frescoes that you see on the side walls of the chapel. Right? And there are essentially six that are left. There were originally eight paintings, right? In other words, one on the entrance wall, because that's what you're looking at right there, one on the altar wall, and then six on the side walls. And the subject matter essentially broke down into scenes from the life of Jesus Christ to the left-hand side of your screen, and scenes from the life of Moses to the right-hand side of your screen. New Testament to the left, Old Testament to the right, and the entire program was essentially a, a creation of, uh, uh, um, of a kind of biblical typology. In other words, that the scenes from the life of Moses prefigure the events and scenes from the life of Jesus Christ. And of course, for Christians, the idea is that those scenes in the life of Jesus are in fact a fulfillment of those scenes in the life of Moses. And the narrative order of them technically was from the altar end, right? um, meaning the uh, wall from which this photograph is taken, to the entrance end back there. So in addition to the uh, assumption of the Virgin Mary by Perugino, being destroyed, we imagine that the earliest scene from the life of Moses would have been the discovery of Moses, which is now lost. So the first Moses scene that we actually see is the one uh, that you have up on your screen here, which is the circumcision of the son of Moses in the lower uh, right-hand corner. Uh, but you also have the exile um, of Moses as well. Um, uh, and then you can see the scene here as he's walking along with the staff being uh, stopped by the angel as he enters inside. And you can see that this earliest scene was in fact painted by Pietro Perugino. So in the narrative sequence, this would have been scene number two. Scene number one, now lost, would have been the discovery of Moses. Scene number two, the circumcision of his son and Moses leaving uh, for Egypt as well. And what I'm going to do is to show you the scenes as they were meant to be appreciated, that is set against each other. And that is the New Testament subject being essentially the fulfillment of the old. Because in the corresponding place on the other side of the Sistine Chapel, we have the baptism of Christ. And you notice that the authorship here is also Pietro Perugino. So this is why we think that originally Sixtus may have planned on having Perugino execute all of the paintings on the side walls of the chapel. And as I mentioned a moment ago, Perugino, in fact, was a student of Andrea del Verrocchio. And so when you actually look at this scene of the baptism of Christ, which you see taking place here, John the Baptist, Jesus standing in the River Jordan, and you think back to a celebrated baptism by Perugino's teacher, whose name was Andrea del Verrocchio, as I mentioned before, of course, in the Uffizi Gallery. Many of you may recognize this painting because at least according to Vasari, it was the extraordinary execution of the angel down here in the lower left by Leonardo da Vinci that led to the premature retirement of um, Verrocchio as a painter. Vasari says that when the teacher saw how good his student Leonardo was, that Verrocchio promised never to paint again. 
Well, the idea, though, that the um, teachings of the master left their mark on the student, because you can see Perugino's baptism over here on the left-hand side of your screen, and you can see Verrocchio's baptism over there on the right-hand side of your screen, and the similarities between them. So not just Lorenzo, but you know the, the imprint of Florence in this powerhouse workshop um, that had been created by Verrocchio. Some of you have heard me talk about, I did dedicate an entire podcast to Andrea Del Verrocchio's workshop because Leonardo was his student, uh, Perugino was his student, something Botticelli was in there for a while, Ghirlandaio, I'll talk about him in just a moment, was his student as well. And you know the six degrees of separation, because remember, Perugino was the teacher of Raphael. Ghirlandaio was the teacher of Michelangelo. And so uh, Verrocchio's sphere of influence went well beyond just his immediate pupils, but we'll leave that for another day. Okay, back to Moses. And here we have the trials of Moses, uh, several different events taking place. And uh oh, look at the authorship, everyone. Alessandro Botticelli. And of course, in Florence, everyone knew that Botticelli was sort of the Medici's painter. He painted those extraordinary scenes uh, for Lorenzo di Pier Francesco, the Primavera, and the birth of Venus. And you can see this, um, I think, easily recognizable style of uh, Botticelli, where he's showing us multiple events, the killing of the Egyptian down below, uh, the daughters of Jethro here, and then the defense of them there, uh, and then Moses removing his shoes up here, and then speaking to the burning bush over there instead. And so this exemplary uh, representation of this late 15th century, early Renaissance style that was exported to Rome by the ambassador named Alessandro Botticelli. Remember, folks, at this time in Rome, there really was no local artistic culture. All the artists had to be imported, uh, as were the artists that we're talking about today. Because on the other side of the chapel, well, oh, actually, not on the other side of the chapel, forget that, not on the other side of the chapel, but the authorship, of course, again, by Botticelli, who had executed the Primavera uh, that you see here, uh, which is located in the Uffizi Gallery. So in a way, this kind of shared genius idea that I mentioned is one that is already very much alive. Sorry, on the other side of the chapel. This is on the other side of the Sistine Chapel. We have another work by Botticelli, uh, which is the Temptations of Christ. I say temptations in the plural, because of course there are three of them that are taking place. Uh, the three Ps, power, pride, and possession as the story goes. And so up here on the temple, you can see the devil. And we know he's the devil because of those uh, grotesque wings behind his back, but dressed as a hermit, disguised, I should say, as a hermit, offering Jesus unlimited power over the cities of the earth. Uh, that is the temptation of power. Here, um, uh, the devil uh, tempting Jesus, who was, of course, fasting oh, for 40 days, to turn stones into bread. And this, of course, technically is uh, possession in the sense of having something physical, um, nourishment, but physical nonetheless. And then, of course, the temptation of pride, where the demon, uh, the devil, tempted Christ to throw himself down from the cliff. Uh, so, of course, this would prove that God would not let a hair on his head be harmed, um, to show, of course, that he was who he said he should be. But what's interesting is that those scenes are taking place in the background. They're almost subsidiary to this uh, image in the front of the sacrifice that's about to take place. And you can also see the presence of contemporary portraits. Uh, in this scene as well. And this is something typical of Florentine art at the time. And one of the more prominent figures in the painting is the female figure that you see here carrying the bundle of wood. Right? And that female figure, who looks quite a bit like uh, Flora from Botticelli's Primavera painting that I showed you a moment ago, which again is not totally surprising because artists often recycled earlier compositions and or ideas. But important for you to know that technically that um, figure is a portrait of a very important woman by the name of Katarina Sforza. All right. Now, remember, technically, Katarina was kind of indirectly responsible for that whole mess, which was the Pazzi conspiracy and the um, subsequent war that took place between Florence and the papacy. Because remember, the town of Imola was sold to Pope Sixtus IV by her father, Ludovico Sforza, as part of her dowry. And she actually appears in the Sistine Chapel in the uh, figure there 
carrying the bundle of wood on her head. And so contemporaries that are actually introduced into the scene as well. Right. Now, here's another of the paint. Oh, in fact, you know, two, one of the artists you've met, Botticelli, that Lorenzo Il Magnifico sent to Rome to paint the walls. Another you're seeing perhaps for the first time, and his name is Cosimo Rosselli. I say perhaps because not everyone agrees that this uh, Old Testament scene of the crossing of the Red Sea, you can see the armies of the Pharaoh here in the water, the Pharaoh himself sinking there on the back of the horse as rain comes down. And the Israelites, of course, here with Moses leading them, um, quite calm, listening to the soothing music instead. Not everyone uh, agrees that this was painted by Cosimo Rosselli uh, because it's not very good, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and so there have been various attributions. You know, one of the things I, I proposed to my students not that long ago while we were dissecting the painting, um, you have some pretty important artists at work. I mean, we've already discussed Perugino, um, Botticelli. You, Rosselli was in the Sistine Chapel. We know that. You just haven't seen his uh, work yet. But they would have had workshops with him. Right? And one wonders whether or not, in an attempt to maybe expedite the whole project, that the uh, maestri, the masters, might have let their top-notch students uh, perhaps even combine their efforts in the execution of the scenes, because the hand here does not seem to correspond to any of the other hands that you see on the side walls of the Sistine Chapel. Like, for instance, the hand of an extraordinarily important Florentine artist named Domenico Ghirlandaio. Ghirlandaio here, uh, um, who painted the calling of the first apostles, Peter and Andrew. Uh, and it really does have this almost stereotypical late 15th century look to it. Um, you have the foreground figures and then that sort of distant uh, background, uh, fantastical sort of setting. I think you can see that these faces are way too detailed to be arbitrary. And in fact, um, typical of late 15th century art to include portraits of contemporary figures in the actual scene. And consider that Ghirlandaio, who was still a rel not relatively unknown, that's not fair. He's an important artist, but he had not yet painted his masterpiece, uh, about which I recorded a podcast, I think, two days ago. Uh, and that, of course, was the fresco decoration inside of the Tornaboni Chapel in um, Santa Maria Novella in Florence. And in fact, you can see the dates there. These frescoes were done three years after his intervention uh, inside of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. But you can clearly see the carryover of the arrangement central scene and then group of contemporary portraits group of contemporary portraits look at his annunciation at zacharias from the tornaboni chapel where we have the angel announcing to zacharias contemporary portraits contemporary portraits and so you know the thumbprint literally of these late 15th century florentine artists uh inside of the sistine chapel All right okay back across now here is a definitive work by this artist cosimo rosselli who of course is not what you'd call a household name, uh, but was very important in late 15th century Florence. And you can see the uh, image here where Moses comes down from Sinai to find the Israelites worshiping the golden calf and he destroys the uh, tablets here in anger. And then he repairs them there in the background of the scene. And this particular Old Testament event corresponding with, of course, the celebrated Sermon on the Mount. So Moses descended from Sinai, Christ stood on the Mount, as he addressed, of course, the throngs of people around him. And this scene also painted by Rosselli, another of his uh, great works inside of the Sistine Chapel. All right. On the other, another Botticelli painting, this time the punishment of Cora. Uh, and you can see a lot of rather energetic activity taking place with the triumphal arch in the background. Uh, and the classical ruins. And so this is something typical now of um, uh, early Renaissance art. And that, of course, is to sort of place it in these classical types of settings, which is exactly what Pietro Perugino does in the scene directly opposite the punishment of Cora, which is the most celebrated of all of the frescoes inside of the Sistine Chapel. And that is the delivery of the keys, right? The sort of uh, imagined event where Jesus gives St. Peter the keys, one gold and one silver, to heaven, the golden one, and earth, the silver one. And that, of course, is the role of the Pope 
to act as intermediary between heaven and earth, between God and us. And so the way uh, Perugino imagines the scene, of course, is in this almost architectural treatise uh, uh, type of space with the triumphal arch, the triumphal arch, and this beautiful uh, and extraordinarily precise centralized temple uh, in the background. In fact, it seems almost as if the architecture is the true subject of the work itself. And consider, by the way, that when conclaves do take place, uh, the tradition was that the uh, cardinal who was assigned the sleeping, because remember in the old days, the cardinals were actually locked in the Sistine Chapel, conclave, conclave, with key, you were locked in until they could, in fact, come up uh, with an agreeable candidate. And whoever the cardinal was who was assigned the sleeping spot or caught below the delivery of the keys was allegedly the one who would become pope uh, later on. That was uh, the superstition. And in fact, when Giulio de la Rovere was elected pope in 1503, he was sleeping underneath this particular work. Now, interesting note, by the way, Perugino is actually in the painting. There's his self-portrait. So his student, Pintoricchio, taking a page out of his book. But as I mentioned, Perugino, the teacher of Raphael, uh, who painted this marriage of the Virgin up in Milan some 20 years later. And look at that temple in the back and the arrangement of the figures in the front. Does it not remind you um, of what we saw a moment ago on the walls of the Sistine Chapel? And of course, I say this only because I think you all know that Raphael would then go back to the uh, 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 apartments of Pope Julius. And so, you know, it all comes full circle. Raphael's teacher painting in the Sistine Chapel, and then Raphael himself painting in the apartments of the Pope that would commission Michelangelo to paint its ceiling, all right? Okay, the last couple of scenes here, the death and testament of Moses painted by a newcomer. You say, oh, Luca Signorelli, who is one of the most important painters in history, who came out of the workshop of Pietro Perugino. And so interesting how an apprentice to one of the active artists would actually execute one of the paintings. That was the esteem uh, uh, in which he was held. And in fact, um, Signorelli's great uh, masterpiece is inside of the Cathedral of Orvieto in a chapel known as the uh, San Brizio Chapel, uh, where he paints this extraordinary Last Judgment. Uh, and in fact, one of the most influential works on the uh, art of Michelangelo, because you can see, like Michelangelo, after him, Signorelli first, Michelangelo later, he was very much interested in the uh, human form, particularly the male nude form. All right. And then the Last Supper that we have here painted by Cosimo Rosselli. Uh, you know, this is a bit old fashioned considering that we are in the 1480s. What's interesting though, is that you have Judas here, isolated, the little devil on his shoulder, Jesus and the apostles, standing around. And then look at the windows. You know, so these are sort of vignettes to uh, Christ in Gethsemane, to the kiss of Judas, and then the crucifixion as well. And you can see that Rosselli in the 1480s, still very much influenced. Uh, here's a close-up of the uh, actual background scenes in those windows by the work of Andrea del Castagno in Florence, who in fact uh, painted essentially the same thing, where you have the Last Supper down here, but then up above, you have the resurrection, the crucifixion, and the entombment instead. And so Rosselli not necessarily capturing the nuance of this, uh, but in a sense, bringing another piece of Florence into the Sistine Chapel. So if you think about it, it is the chapel where popes are elected, but the overall artistic imprint inside of the chapel is a Florentine one. And when you say Florence, you say Medici. And so here with the Sistine Chapel, another example, of course, of how these two families intertwine. A um, della Rovere Pope who built the chapel, and then, of course, first Lorenzo in sending down Rosselli, Ghirlandaio, and Botticelli, but also then forming artistically a Michelangelo who would come back some 36 years later and, of course, uh, execute that extraordinary ceiling that you see behind me. All right, folks, with that, I'm going to stop for today. I want to leave some time uh, for some Q&A, uh, and then next week we'll continue with our discussion, of course, uh, into that uh, concept of shared genius. All right, fantastic. Well, we've got questions coming in, and we'll get to as many as we can. Just a reminder that you can type your question in that Q&A box that you see at the top or the bottom of your screen. So we've had a couple of different versions of this question, which is about 
all of the portraits that appear um, in the crowds in a lot mm -hmm. of these scenes. So how do you get to be in the, in the crowd? Do you have to donate money? Are you a supporter or a patron of the artist? And do we have any examples of folks who are, uh, shall we say, cast as, as less favorable representations, maybe as doubles or as villains? Um, what, do we, what do we know about that? Yeah, so most of the portraits there are portraits of late 15th century. You can't really, well, I guess they could be called courtiers, let's say, but they would be important Roman citizens. And so it's sort of different. You know, in Florence, we have a pretty good uh, idea of who the people appear, uh, um, who the people who appear in the art actually are. Uh, in Rome, lesser because they're not, let's say, as prominent. But a lot of it mm. had to do with those sort of high ranking people in the court, because remember, the Pope did have a court. He was considered a secular ruler as well uh, that would appear, many of whom, in fact, did uh, later become or were at that time patrons uh, of the artists themselves. And so in a way, it's almost like the artists kind of ingratiating themselves so that you put mm. a portrait of a person who might be a, a potential employer uh, later on. No negative, by the way. I know that negative thing always comes, of course, with Michelangelo and the placement yeah. of the uh, papal uh, master of ceremonies as the figure of Minos in The Last Judgment. But um, it took somewhat of a Michelangelo, the caliber, let's say, of a Michelangelo to get away with something like that. Because, of right. course, you know, he was the rock star. Uh, and Pope mm -hmm. Paul III, who actually got a kick out of Michelangelo's inclusion of his master of ceremonies in hell, um, I don't think a Perugino or a Botticelli or Ghirlandaio would have gotten away with that, particularly with a Pope as irascible as Sixtus IV. Right, right, yeah. Turning to the uh, the Last Supper that we see on the screen now, the Rosselli Last Supper, um, can you talk a little bit about the some of the stuff in the extreme foreground? We've got some what looked like silver or tableware. We've got some pets. What's yeah. What's happening here? Well, the, the, the tableware is, of course, because it's the supper. So this is the sort of obviously the, the uh, right. objects with which dinner will be served, particularly the drinks. You can see them there. But then the, uh, the dog and the cat. Um, the cat is traditionally associated with, with Satan. And you'll see them mm. appear in Last Suppers because the idea, at least according to the Gospel of John, is that the moment that Judas uh, decides to go through with the betrayal of Jesus Christ, that the devil takes hold of him. And you can actually see it happening with the little demon mm. on his shoulder, but the, you know, the cat representing essentially the presence of the devil, but then the dog, you know, rather heroically trying to ward it off. And so it's this eternal struggle between good and evil. Hmm. We've got a question about the portrait of Lorenzo that we saw uh, at the beginning. And um, there's a face that's reflected slightly to the right. Can you tell us who that is if we know, or is it just a reflection? It is a mask. It is the, um, mm. the, the, the typical tragicomica mask you see in mm -hmm. this Venice Mora, where essentially one half of it is smiling and the other uh, half is grimacing. Uh, and it represents um, dramaturgy, it represents uh, theater. Uh, and of course, mm. Lorenzo as the great patron of the arts. And so the, that tragicomica mask is just one sort of symbolic representation of his involvement with the arts, one type of art yeah. per se. All right, got a couple of questions about, about background. So it's interesting that a lot of these architectural uh, studies, as you've, as you've said, show up in this sort of featureless abstract landscape where there's kind of nothing going on. But then sometimes we see cities or what look like hillsides or towns in the background. To what extent are those just sort of you know, generic, fantastical, could be any Italian countryside, or do they map onto real depictions of real cities? Both. Um, mm. I, I think before Leonardo da Vinci, uh, well, that's not, well, okay. Piero della Francesca, who we, we talked about in the first lecture in the series, uh, I think may have been the first to sort of pay attention and to consciously try to reproduce what he saw so that we'll talk about it next week actually that famous double portrait of the duke and duchess of urbino where the, mm -hmm. the landscape looks very much like the landscape around the city of urbino um right. leonardo comes along and uh both <laughs> psycho um analysts like sigmund freud to start uh, and then our historians looking to either find the geographical source of inspiration 
or the subconscious source of inspiration or what have you. Um, you know, I think most of the backgrounds that you see are really not necessarily a very sophisticated attempt at rendering countryside. Because remember, they're, mm -hmm. they're Florentine artists. They're just, they'll take that beautiful countryside almost for granted. And so these same right. kind of rolling hills and cities that don't really correspond to any particular place most of the time. There are exceptions, of yeah. course, where we'll spot uh, a representation of a particular city, place, fortress, or what have you. But most of the time, I think it's just fill in the background. Hmm. Well, speaking of landscapes, um, we have uh, one question about the gardens. So can you tell us a little bit about how they're part of that complex in this period, who might have access to them, um, if the way they look now is is similar, um, and I can't let it go without putting in a plug for the paintings, because of course we've taken a lot of restoration work in the gardens as well. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, could you could you talk a little bit about that? The remember the whole concept of the garden, everyone at this time. It's a little early, um, in the sense mm. that. The Medici Palace in Florence is 1450-ish and had a garden, right? But it's the seminal Renaissance style palace. And so they're basing it on an ancient Roman domus. So street, building, and then garden behind it. Um, the, the tradition isn't, what's the word? It hasn't come back enough yet. So for instance, you know, many of you may remember last summer, one of the, the lectures that I gave for the patrons was on the Renaissance pleasure palaces. Uh, and that mm -hmm. the first of which was in fact, the, the building that today we call the Villa Farnesina. Uh, and that dates to 1508. Um, so that, you know, that we're talking early 16th century when there was this return to a kind of leisurely type of architecture. Um, and with that, the gardens themselves. So at first, I'd say for pretty much the 16th, 17th um, and towards the end let's say uh, 16th and 17th and first half of the 18th century, it's the Italian garden where the garden mm -hmm. itself was geometrical, very architectural and manicured or what have you. But then by the end of the 18th century, uh, the English garden um, and its style began to take hold where it was more of a kind of forced wild, you know, sort of pretending like right. things standard on their own, but were manicured nonetheless. But Italian style gardens would dominate from, let's say, about 1500 or so till, I'd say, 1750-ish. Got it. Okay, well, we've got time for about one more question, mm -hmm. and uh, it's about where we can learn more. So um, one, of our, uh, one of our attendees wants to know, you mentioned a couple of podcasts that you've been recording. Where do we find them? How do we listen to them? Where do we subscribe? You'll find my podcast name is called Rebuilding the Renaissance, and it'll, it's on every major platform, uh, Apple, Spotify, Google, um, iHeartRadio, et cetera, et cetera. Just Google Rebuilding the Renaissance or my name. But, but you'll also find them on my website. So if you just go to www. and then rockyregiro.com, uh, everything's up there from the podcast to the online courses, to the webinars, to our reading suggestions, to several documentaries that I've made in the past. Um, the most recent one was on the Medici that was uh, aired on PBS. And I'm sorry, no, the most recent one was on Florence, Florence, the Art of Magnificence that was aired on PBS in 2018. It's all on the website and it's fairly user-friendly. So I think you'll have an easy time. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we'll include that link, of course, in our post-show notes that you guys will get. And to answer the other question we get every week, how do you uh, watch these lectures again or catch up on one you missed? Well, the answer is you can always find them on the patrons YouTube channel. So just head to that link. It's California Northwest Patrons of the Arts Vatican Museums, or you can just type that into YouTube. We'll send that link to you in our follow-up emails. And if you can't wait for the edit to go up, you can always find live stream on Facebook and hello to all of our friends who are watching on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash official CPAVM. And of course, we wouldn't be here without the sponsorship of the patrons, as well as the Friends of Uffizi, both phenomenal nonprofit organizations that support the restoration and conservation of tremendously important art collections. So if you'd like to learn more about how to support that work, to become a member, or to support particular restoration projects, you can visit californiapatrons.org or friendsofuffizigallery.org.
And so from all of us at the patrons, thank you so much for being with us. Please join us next week when we'll have um, our concluding lecture of our four part series, looking at uh, in a little bit more depth, some of the shared masterworks between these two world-class collections. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. Rocky, thanks so much. As Very welcome always. everyone. Happy Father's Day to everyone.